join them. Okay. Take the leader. So, uh, yeah, I'm Tom Millar. I'm from US CERT. Um, I've been there for about seven years, all told, at this point. Uh, all of this current administration and a little bit of the preceding one. Um, I have been described as a force for continuity because US CERT is kind of uh, infamous for its turnover rate. Um, I'm the chief of communications there. And uh, before I get too heavy into my introduction, let me explain a little bit about the talk, actually. What we um, decided to do was we're going to try and do this um, uh, somewhere in between a presentation and a panel where Doug and I are both moder I am I am the moderator for Doug and his one-man panel, and Doug is the moderator for Tom's one-man panel. So we have a series of topics that we think are salient um, for information sharing and the problem is we've observed it over the years, and we're going to basically going to ping pong back and forth as we go through each topic. You'll hear my side of the story. You'll hear Doug's perspective. Um, initially, I think we were going to be much more uh, choreographed and try and do this. Uh, that's me on the left. Doug is on the right. Um, much more choreographed and uh, be playing sort of good cop, bad cop about information sharing. Um, then we realized that sometimes we basically uh, both, you know, Sometimes we agree for different reasons on uh, various issues we see with the, the state of practice, and uh, you'll get to hear from us as we go through the various pieces. So, uh, yeah, so in, in a historic context, Tom is usually the curmudgeon, and I've been the idealist. And it's funny, though, because when Josh asked me to give this talk, I realized that um, my idealism is somewhere on the floor, having been trampled with cleats and uh, limping towards the hospital room at this point in time. At the same time, though, I'm still doing this, and I'm still trying to do this. Um, as Josh mentioned, I was the open IOC guy. I still am the open IOC guy for FireEye now, previously Mandiant. Um, but it's interesting because you know I came out in 2011 with, yeah, let's do this awesome sharing thing. It was wonderful. And um, it's very interesting because at that time, I had great expectations, and the community kind of threw it under a bus. And I think over time, that's kind of swapped. I think now. Um, Having fought the battle of sharing and trying to get uh, threat intelligence and other stuff shared, um, and again, so you're going to hear us use terms interchangeably. You're going to hear threat intelligence, threat information, um, just intel in general. Um, I know there are fine points, and people might want to quibble about those. Save that till the Q and A. There are definite distinctions. We'll probably use them interchangeably, just because we're up here being glib smart asses. But. Um, yeah, so I mean, I spent a lot of time lobbying for this and uh, took a lot of you know bruising to the ego because initially everyone's like, so what? And what's interesting is sharing has now morphed into an overloaded buzzword to the point that everybody at RSA thinks that, hey, this is going to solve all the problems. And I'm the guy sitting there going, whoa, 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 sharing. It's, it's, got, some, it's got some issues. Um, so we will see some interesting counterpoint here, hopefully, because um, traditionally a couple years ago I was the guy going, yes, and Tom was the guy going, wait. And now we've sort of switched roles on some issues. And it's funny, though, because there's one thing later in the presentation. I'm like, and here's exactly how it works. And Tom's like, and that's what's wrong with things today. So, um, so yeah, we're here to talk about sharing. Um, and uh, it's interesting because I think what people mean when they say sharing is very different things. And I think that that is one of the problems that we have is that um, a lot of terms in this industry like sharing get really overloaded. Uh, somebody has a specific meaning they have for it, and then they want to improve on it, and then everybody's like, hey, this sells products, and they start using it and everything. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a little bit on the bitter side. Uh, I think that, honestly, a lot of people, when they say sharing right now, they really want a free threat intel feed. They're like, yeah, I like intel sharing. That means I get free threat intel, right? Um, <clears throat> I think then there's a slightly smaller group of people that don't actually mean sharing. They mean very tightly controlled dissemination of information. So like, well, I'll share, but I'm only going to share with these three people. If I can make sure this information only goes two steps, and this person can't use this information for that, and this particular package is only seen by these five organizations. And then I think there's a much smaller group um, who are the group who I think have kind of got it right, um, where basically what they want is they want an ecosystem or a feedback loop where you have a set of resources Ideally, threat intelligence, but there's also going to be data and other pieces involved, um, which does have controlled dissemination, but it also has this important distinction of having a feedback loop so that when you're giving the information out, you're also hearing back from other people. And that's one of the reasons it's made me kind of bitter is, you know, I am biased. I've been working with the people who've been putting a lot of effort into getting the larger systems with the feedback loops out. 
And when we go to try and get other people to participate, a lot of times what we go is people going, hey, what are you going to give us for free? This is really cool. So I developed this view that there's a lot of people out there who want a free lunch. There's a medium immediate group of people who have been switching stuff around for years, and it's kind of worked for them, but they don't see a reason to change. And then there's a small group <clears throat> that is really trying to build a relatively complex solution that everybody benefits in this sort of weird balance of power, um, but it's really hard to stand up. So I think everybody actually wants the right thing. So when Doug characterizes these sort of like these three tranches of cyber information sharing uh, practitioners or wannabes or whatever, what have you, he's actually um, he's actually like he's like, he's kind of describing a customer demographic that I think is colored by maybe hanging a little bit around a little bit too much at you know cynicism generating trade shows, and I totally see that that from certain vendor communities who you know, are in the business of selling subscriptions to threat intelligence services and threat intelligence feeds, that um, giving people some sort of like simple indicators of compromise feed and charging them an annual fee um, means they exactly think that people want either a free lunch um, and people are not going to be part of, you know, people are not interested in being part of this ecosystem with the feedback loop and all the other good stuff. What I see when I talk to people who are in the field and they want to, you know, like get involved in a sharing community, whether it be one facilitated by my parent agency or another one that's facilitated by an industry or sector group or even a regional uh, community, is that they do all want that feedback loop. And people do want to sort of DIY and, uh, and fend for themselves uh, amongst their trust community. What I feel like the gap is is that that kind of trust community, the technologies that um, underpin it, the relationships between people that underpin it, um, and uh, and any sort of like mutual agreements or other you know paperwork that has to be signed to make sure that the legal frameworks are there that can underpin it and strengthen it, those things are what takes a long time to build. Even if you, uh, for example, in, in, you know, uh, Soltra, you know, gave their you know their taxi server to the healthcare ISAC, whatever, right? There will be people who have things and they can give them to you, but actually implementing them, kind of like implementing a sim, you have to put some time in, some elbow grease, and actually do it right, and that takes effort. But it's not that people just want the really simple free stuff. People do want the right things. Put Sultra in the taxi. OK. <laughs> um, off the rails immediately. Um, yes. If you don't know, Styx and Taxi are a couple of technical specifications that Homeland Security has uh, invested in. Um, they're community led, so there's been a tremendous amount of private sector input, including from uh, Doug's parent. and. Uh, and they're going to be going into an actual international standards body soon, which is really exciting, but we'll get to that later. Um, but basically, there are ways of saying, like, here's some syntax, here's some you know, basic message handling fun functions, here's a way to start building your um, automated information sharing and data structures uh, without having to just start from scratch. And the financial sector um, actually saw so much value in this and has been a major driver from the get-go. They wrote... Um, uh, a server that supports these technical specifications. It's called Soltra, um, and actually spun that off from one of the uh, payment clearing corporations. So Soltra is like it's now its own concern, separate from uh, the bank that birthed it. So that was actually that the intellectual property there, that taxi server, taxi compatible server um, that ships around cool <coughs> intelligence things, um, was provided gratis to the National Healthcare ISAC as they were standing up. And if you don't know, an ISAC is an information sharing and analysis center, and we'll get to that as well later. Yeah, and if it's um, if it's another clear distinction, because a lot of people hear sticks and taxi, sticks is how you describe the threat intelligence, taxi is the suggestion as to how you move that around. So you put something into sticks format and then use taxi to share sticks with other people. So some people think the two are interchangeable. They're tightly coupled, but they're not interchangeable. You can use sticks without using taxi. You can use taxi without using sticks. But if you hear them use taxi as the transport mechanism, sticks is the way of describing threat itself. So, um, remember to share your meat. Yeah. So, Tom. Yeah, we did. So that's another thing too. Um, if people do have questions, again, we are doing this relatively free form. So. Um, we do intend to have some time for Q&A at the end, but we also do tend to ramble on. So if you want to throw something in there, ask, feel free. Um, so one of the other things in my, my, the uh, dark age of my bitterness is, um, is, and this is, I think, I have this about pretty much the entire security industry now, not just threat intelligence, is the fact, though, that when you do go out and you see the 
places at the field where people are selling things, a lot of the selling is going around the fact that most of the people out there want to buy a really simple solution to a complex problem. And instead of railing on about vendors and other stuff like that for a long period of time, as a reminder, I work for a vendor. Um, I just I, I see that as one of the problems, and I think that's one of the other fundamental differences that Tom and I have right now is that um, when you start talking about sharing, most people, I feel, are looking for a very simple solution to a very complex problem. And that's one of the fundamental imbalances that we need to get past, is especially now that it's being pushed so much. Um, you know, basically, you're getting pressure from the current administration. You're getting pressure from vendors who want to make sales. Everybody's telling you, sharing is the way to go. And one of the reasons that I say, whoa, now, is I, a couple years ago, was like, this is awesome, and it's so easy, coming from a fairly complicated technical and organizational standpoint. And I found out even starting there, it was really difficult. Um, so I just have this built-in thing, which I'm hoping Tom will help me debunk during the course of this, that the barrier to sharing is often really, really high. And that's one of the reasons that I feel it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be. And that's why I'm really wary of the fact that everybody comes out and says, the answer to your problem is sharing. Yes, this is your this is your DVR comment though. If you want to oh. take that, and if not, um, we can move on to the next slide. Oh well, I feel like everybody has to start somewhere, right? A lot of conversations, especially this. Oh, so I'm sorry, inline heckling. Um, so you keep saying sharing. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm just a little lost. But sharing of what? Of the performance data, of the policies, of the processes. Of exactly. So, so everybody has to start somewhere, and what I'd like to see people get to is sharing the good, the, the good hard stuff, right? The policies, the processes, the mitigations or courses of action that actually work to protect their network, or like, you know, the, type, the types of ideas we talk about at this conference, right? Like, so here's a better metric than CBSS, right? Share that, right? I would love for communities to have those kinds of great conversations that really advance the, the, the state of practice. To get there, though, and this is where Doug and I were also differing, was basically like, I'm like, start with some IPs, man. Right? Let's, uh, here, look, here's my blacklist. Can you show me your blacklist? Great, let's mix the blacklist together. Look, we found out where there's a major overlap, or there's hardly any overlap. We learned something. It was something trivial, it's something time sensitive, it's something that doesn't maybe have a greatest you know, shelf life and isn't you know, edifying, but it is, you know, hey, we were actually able to email each other some information about our cybersecurity posture and glean a tiny nugget from it. That's how all of these things have to begin. Everything about the sharing programs that Homeland Security is pursuing, from my perspective, is about giving people an on-ramp. We're trying to facilitate people like sort of having their training wheels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in some cases, people do want a simple solution. I'm like, right, because the point of our specific, and, and give them simple solutions when they want them. I'm not gonna stand in your way and say that you're not allowed to rewind your television until you can build your own DVR. That was the uh, comment Doug was referring to, because I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell you the specifications for the encodings and all the other different things that make your DVR work. I'm just going to sell you a DVR. Let's give you that box, and then you can do what you want with it, right? The whole idea with Sticks and Taxi came from my history with the miserable information sharing experience, which was that I tried to get the whole U.S. government to start shipping incident reports and indicators around in an old, older specification called IODEF. And in my naivete, I looked at IODEF and I said, hey, got an RFC number. Like, it's RFC 5070. It's like on the standards track. That means it must be in all kinds of products everywhere, right? I mean, the Internet Engineering Task Force doesn't just publish stuff if nobody's going to build running code. Well, yeah, somebody built some running code that actually had IODEF in it in 2003. Um, and ask ArcSight where that running code is now. So I went around trying to, you know, really caning this IODEF idea to like a hundred different departments and agencies all over the government said, this is what we're going to do and we're all going to do it together and it'll be great because I'm thinking this is a simple like sort of like, hey, let's plug in this XSD and yeah, these products are already probably compatible with it because it's a standards track RFC. I mean, gosh. And uh, all, all my hopes and dreams were thoroughly crushed into a fine powder because it's nowhere, right? Literally, I found the two operational running instances in the world that regularly use IODEF to ship things around and this was like circa 2011. And they were both private sector and both of them weren't really doing standards compliant IODEF. They were literally like, I needed a shortcut to build my table structure, so I just ran like data store.py on the XSD from the RFC and then I was done, right? I'm like, oh, 
So it wasn't about interoperability, it was about a shortcut to a table structure so you could store IPs and domains? Yeah, that's what I did. So our idea with Sticks and Taxi and is built on some of my lessons, the lessons I learned from that IODEF experience, which was let's write some specs and then let's you know, go around to the vendor community and say, hey, you should support this. And then let's recruit people with bigger pockets and bigger pocketbooks than even the US government itself from a cybersecurity investment standpoint, and that would be the financial sector, the oil sector, energy, natural gas, and get them to say they want sticks and taxi support in product lines. And you wouldn't believe how fast Big Red, Big Yellow, and some of the other major vendors started to pivot and figure this out, which is also kind of when Doug got a little bit cynical with us because he's like, you've got all these people saying, yes, we support sticks and taxi, and nobody really knows what that means. Yeah, from my point of view, we're still in the process of learning how to build a DVR, and people are passing around fifth generation VHS tapes, and you can kind of see the picture if you look carefully. So, all right, so one of the things I've found, again, in the security industry, there's a lot of terms that get a lot of buzz, and that often means that term gets really, really overloaded. So I opened up before by saying that a lot of people mean different things by sharing. I often find it's useful to go back to what a word actually means by looking it up in this old-fashioned thing called the dictionary. Although I, I did use the Merriam-Webster website as opposed to a brick-and-mortar book. Um, but what's interesting is, again, a lot of people think, seem to think that sharing connotates you take something from entity X and you give something to entity Y. And if you look at the definition here, or at least the initial definitions here, is realistically it's not about transfer, it's about common usage. It's about the fact that you're talking about something that I have, instead of me taking it and giving it to Tom and I don't have it anymore, I'm actually taking the thing I have and making it so Tom can use part of it. So I'm either dividing it or we're both using that same piece of information. And I think that's a real subtle distinction, but I think that's very important because it changes how you look at sharing overall to realize it's not me giving something. It's me taking something I have and making it available for you to use it. But that means I still have it. I still have buy-in, and it is still also partially my responsibility. Um, so, so, so it's bi-directional or there's no direction? Well, so I, I think it's the, it's the fact that it's not something you can just push from one entity to the other. So I, I think what you're going to hear me say over time as I go through more of these slides is it's bi-directional and it's also asymmetrical. But if both parties are not invested, it's not working. Like if I, if US CERT is just pushing information out to constituents, that's not sharing, that's broadcasting. If FireEye is just shipping indicators out to its customers and you know the customers just kind of take them and walk off and they never talk again, that's, that's publishing, that's not sharing. So I think that the thing that really makes this stuff work is you have to realize if you have a sharing relationship, all the parties need to be invested. They may be invested for different reasons and different motivating factors, but the sharing platform, content, whatever, needs to be something that both sides are invested in or it doesn't work. I don't think Tom had any real hard arguments against this one. No, I just have the, yeah. the picture. Oh, yes, sorry. I keep, I keep forgetting to get to the good parts. So, right. um, We need every scrap. Yeah, and I mean, again, so I, I think that right now what you have is you have a situation, those levels of strata that I described before where you have people who are really interested in these complex ecosystems, we need to figure out ways to convince the people who want a three threat, free threat intel feed that they should play along with us and that they should do something compelling. The problem is a lot of times coming from somebody who works for a vendor, people are like, oh, you just want to sell your product. Um, and I mean, obviously I do because that's how I make my living, but realistically, the reason that I promote sharing has not ever been for a profit motive. It's because we could get better collectively by doing sharing. Whereas if we're just looking at things from profit and sales and silos the way people have been historically, we don't necessarily get any further. Um, so anyhow, I think that sharing is going to have to involve everybody having a vested interest. It's going to be asymmetrical. You're going to have different motivating factors, but if you can work those all together, it's going to be okay. But that expectation needs to be in there. So many people just think sharing is transferred from A to B or you know, something where it's given from one entity to the other and then you walk away. So. And I think, again, though, I still think that the nature of that conversation is colored because of a, you know, a few people who are in the room who are basically selling something as, you know, like at the threat intelligence feed, right? And there's nothing wrong with selling threat intelligence feeds. I don't mean to denigrate that business model one bit. But the idea is that other people's idea, because of various heuristics and biases and 
things like that. Other people's idea of what information sharing is, is it's like, oh, it's like a free version of that thing that guy at the booth was telling me about. It's not that, right? We're trying to get people to understand that it is a different type of relationship, um, that your investment is what matters most, and hence this slide um, is like basically pointing out making fun a little bit of the government's uh, position on information sharing, or at least the way people have characterized it, which is not entirely false, which is like, hey, private sector, give us all your indicators. Oh, you wanted something back. Um, hang on for a second. Um, now, I would say like we, we've done much better at sort of fulfilling our end of the value proposition over, over the years, but initially it is very much sort of like a little bit of an attitude that some people, some colleagues of mine will take, which is that we should just get our indicators from everybody or we'll regulate them giving all their indicators to us or something like that, which I think is a complete non-starter for various reasons. All right. So one of the other things I think that we've um, disagreed about is what's involved to get started in threat information sharing. And I don't know that I necessarily degree, disagree with Tom that it's easy to get started at the really simple level. I just don't know that it really helps very much if you do that. And so that's my, my bit of cynicism. Um, so I think it was first at, uh, so there's a ton of maturity models in the security field. I've heard some people say, oh, we don't need them for threat intelligence. Um, I apologize if anyone has like the perfect one. I know that um, uh, at the SAN Cyber Threat Intelligence Summit in 2013, Lockheed Martin had one that they'll probably copyright. Um, I know that Forrester is making one right now and was talking about that at RSA. But assume a theoretical threat intelligence maturity model. I wasn't going to take the time to do that. I think one exists. And um, my concern is that any maturity model you make for threat intelligence relies on being pretty high along the other maturity models for your security posture. You have to have insight into what's going on in your organization. You have to have the ability to do something about what's going on in your organization. All these other things where if you look at, like, you know, say it's a scale of zero to five, you need to be at like a three or a four on all the other security stuff, in my opinion, before threat intel actually really starts helping you out. So I gave a talk a few years back um, at a forum in a uh in McLean, Virginia, with a lot of private sector folks there as well. And um, that's how tall you have to be. Um, and that was, uh, I started the whole thing, was, it was like, all right, so you know, who in the room has some threat intelligence that they could share? And nobody raised their hand. And then I said, who has a free email account? Everybody raises their hand. Like, great, you have threat intelligence to share. That's what the little like red bang button that lets you mark emails as phishing is for. You know, you sharing your threat intelligence with whoever your email provider is. Um, and I'd like, everybody has to start somewhere. You can't go up to somebody and tell them like, whoa, you're only in the seventh grade, you're never gonna make it in college. Um, you know, the maturity model does exist, and I think every, you know, everybody starts at zero and that's fine. And I think you can be at zero and start getting involved in a sharing community, and you'll find your way to turn into a, a contributor or a producer of your own threat intelligence. The first step, as Doug put it, is basically like, hey, I think I could glean something from this. Maybe I should go find some people in, an, in, a, in a community that I can learn from, um, and, you know, and I can get started figuring out how I can contribute. Again, if you run a network, you probably have some logs. You probably have an IDS. Like some other talks, like um, Mike was talking about or before lunch, right? He's 50,000 IDS feeds from all over the place. And because that's what people do, you invest in an IDS. The IDS produces some kind of output, and that is the beginning of some sort of valuable threat intelligence, or maybe threat intelligence isn't the word for that, but some kind of valuable information that could be, um, you know, contributed into the pool of a community's collective knowledge and then benefited from. So I do, fu I fundamentally disagree with the idea that you have to be like pretty dang good at cybersecurity before you start sharing um, information. Do I believe that you should probably be making a lot of other defensive investments before you get, you know, a threat intelligence feed from, you know, a you know, highfalutin threat intelligence service vendor? Uh, yeah, there's absolutely a bunch of other stuff you need to make sure, you know, like, I hate this term too, but cyber hygiene, right? Those are the types of things you need to take care of first. Then you can, you know, start make, you know, paying in to that um, threat intelligence kitty, but there's no, like, minimum required awesome risk posture before you get into an information sharing relationship. I'm not taking sides, but just you're creating tension in my brain because I lean towards what Doug's saying. If you look at Michael Royman's uh, contribution to the DDIR, well everyone's talking about like real-time attack information for O days, 
97% of last year's successful exploits were tracked back to 10 CVEs, eight of which were 10 years old. So it's not that you can't contribute. I completely agree with you. It's that it becomes an oasis in the desert when you should be just doing some really basic stuff that we allow our data for. So it, to me, it's more about order of operations, like how much how much of our limited time and budget do I put into getting better at patching 10, 12-year-old vulnerabilities that are entirely avoidable before I start worrying about ODAs or getting killed in China. So I think I might be jumping ahead in response to your to your argument. I might be jumping ahead of myself a little bit in our notes, but it's okay. <laughs> my, my point is basically like maybe the way somebody finds out that like they have a bunch of shadow shadow IT that is you know like now attack surface that's affecting everybody else, you know like oh those unmanaged devices on my network are a real problem for the rest of the internet and I am you know like I am hosting a bunch of spawn of the devil inside my own you know network. Um, maybe they find out about that because first they decide like hey I heard about this threat intelligence information sharing thing that's really cool I'm going to go to this big meeting that Homeland Security is facilitating. And, uh, and find out more about it. And they get there, and they see somebody give a talk where they say, these CVEs are really old and terrible. What is wrong with people? And they say, I don't know if I have any of those CVEs. And they go back, and they find out. So this is an on-ramp to all kinds of knowledge, right? If this is what it takes to get you in the room, is to say, like, hey, three, free threat and tell, then I'll post that on the door wherever. So part of my journey for this... Because, I mean, then realistically doing this talk was that. I don't mean to get all philosophical, but it's funny because initially when Josh was like, hey, would you do this? My response was no, because it's too depressing. <laughs> and as time has gone on, it's made me think about it differently, which is hopefully what I'm here sharing today and will help you guys think about it differently as well. But um, So going back to the idea that it's an asymmetrical relationship, my thought is that, and again, I, I mean, I hate to sound elitist, but there are a lot of people who don't really contribute threat intel, but pretty much everybody can contribute data that can become threat intel. And uh, to me, that's, that's an important distinction. And it's hard to say that politely, though, when somebody's like, oh, I want to do threat intel sharing. And you're kind of like, well, you know, that's nice, but I'm not going to trust anything you send me. We get into trust. That's a very important part of it later. But there'll be some great data points for my people to analyze who I do trust and do something with. And again, so the trick then becomes trying to figure out the proper motivating factors to get the different parties at the different maturity and trust levels to the table so that they can all contribute at the same time. So, um, so one of the things that also bubble right. up in this, though, is that we, you know, people are coming to this with different expectations. We have to look at what problem we're trying to solve. Um, and one of the things that, uh, you know, much as we talk about high maturity, low maturity, um, I think even a lot of the mature organizations, aside from a very elite few, are still having a really hard time with this. Uh, this is one thing where <clears throat> Tom and I initially completely disagreed, and over time we're like, holy crap, we are totally saying the same thing. Um, because realistically, I think the problem everyone's trying to solve is not really anything great with threat intelligence. They want to stop being punched in the face, which is why my generic quote here. I mean, basically, you have this huge scrum going on in the internet with everybody duking it out. And realistically, and again, this goes back to my critique of the overall industry, but not just threat intelligence, but it comes back to that, is most people don't want to do threat intelligence. They don't want to have an intel group. They want to have a SOC, an analyst. They want to mitigate risk by spending some money and having a problem go away. And a lot of people see this as this is the new hotness. They've been going to things, you know, the, the big nameless trade show, I'll stop picking on it by name, or, or other things like that. And they keep being told, hey, this box will solve all your problems if you buy it this year. And it keeps not happening. And so this is a new thing. It doesn't necessarily fit in a box, but people are like, hey, I want to get on this. It's new. It's hot. It's wonderful because it will make my problem go away. And um, you know, that, that's one of the things we realize is even examining people at relatively high levels of maturity, um, we don't necessarily have a clearly defined set of what we're trying to do with this. And that's, I did like the metrics thing earlier where, I mean, I, I think metrics is still, metrics is a very well-defined field in a lot of other areas. In security, it's really horrible because we try to measure everything and we don't know how to measure anything. Um, but I really appreciated the fact that you stated that we basically needed to have threat intelligence applied against a lot of these other things. Because in a lot of cases, we're just grabbing this and we don't necessarily know what we're trying to do with it. Sorry, I'm probably wandering off script here with my things. Um, script. Yeah, psh, script, such as it is. Um, but, I mean, to me, like, 
I, I think a lot of people are just, they want to pay money to make things stop, and they don't know how to make the transition, but like, this is a new thing which theoretically stops the problem. How do we transition that? Um, sorry. Go ahead. Right, and, uh, you know, this is where I'm saying, like, people know that they have a problem, right? More and more people are like, oh, I, you know, I, you know, I probably need to find out, you know, if there's a breach in my network or if I'm exposed or compromised or something like that. So people are coming to the table more than they used to. I trade all the way back to like 2009 and Operation Aurora and things like that. I think when you know the the big search company that everybody knows publishes a blog post saying like, um, you know, China took my pants, um, then everybody else gets automatically a tremendous uh, degree more comfortable sort of sharing their dirty linen, right? They're like, they even got Google. Those guys are the smartest. So everybody got, a, and also they didn't go out of business, right? That was the other key, which was that everybody was sort of waiting, who's going to be the first person that makes the news and what's going to happen to their stock price and how hard are they going to get hit with shareholder lawsuits? That didn't happen um, after opera. I mean, things like that have started to burble up because I think there is a little bit of impatience with other people, like customers. Um, but it's one of those things where people are now really cognizant of the fact that, they, they, that there is this threat intelligence thing. Maybe it won't make the pain go away. I'm not as cynical about sort of the average cybersecurity con consumer, if you will. I think they think, this will tell me more how much pain I'm in. Right? This will more accurately let me assess you know, the degree and type of problems that I have. And that's, the, that's like sort of the, the first step is sort of like scoping out sort of like how you're, how you're impacted by these threats I keep reading about the news. Um, and then, you know, then I can make better decisions about how to invest to address it. That was one of the other things I've, I've seen value in, as much as it annoys me, because I think all the stuff where you talk about attribution and give really cute names to these various campaign actors, all that stuff to me just kind of reads like one of those Hollywood gossip columns. Like, just imagine that, you know, like, Dancing Panda is in bold italics every time it appears. Like, you'll never believe who was inside the Federal, you know, Communications Commission's networks last night. Um, and, but the thing is, there's value in that because... And again, this is the classic Tom jumps way ahead of himself in the notes. Um, there's value in that because a label, as silly as it might seem to those of us who have more experience in the profession, the chocolate worm cakes. Um, it's a great threat group, by the way. Yeah, beware of chocolate worm cakes. They come in various sizes. Um, <clears throat> so the value in these labels is that they give like a hook for, you know, your stakeholder, decision maker, boss, etc., to hang on to, and they'd be like, "Oh, are we affected by you know like chocolate worm cakes?" And you'd say, "Like, actually, uh, based on all the information sharing we've been doing with the other people in our sector and region, we know that chocolate worm cakes are not currently affecting us and not targeting our sector." Great, I love that report. Right? Don't have to explain how Heartbleed works. You just say Heartbleed. People are like, "Oh, that's that thing. It gets headlines." So you skipped the more cynical point that you brought up earlier in our discussions on this, so I'm going to drag you back to it. Um, so another thing, though, is that, uh, and I'd be curious to see the sort of room's consensus because we each have our own views on these two things, one of which is, um, is it easier to go to somebody who controls your purse strings and say, hey, we're being attacked by chocolate worm cakes. Give me some money. Versus we're being attacked by unknown threat exploiting these CVEs and these CVSS score things. And, you know, it, insert all the acronyms. But if you can say the country of chocolate worm cakes is after us and out to get us, is that going to get you your budget and your funding? And is that going to enable your security program? And is that unethical to do? Or is that just smart business? It addresses, it takes a really long time to put, a, you know, a good mental model into a novice, right? If you have an executive, you know, who is, uh, you know, your main investment decision maker or, you know, somebody in that sort of, that type of position, the C-suite folks, right, who don't do security most of the time, their mental models of things are based on humans and transactions and, you know, like attacks and, you know, words like that. And if you can put it in that language and sort of make it fit that mental model with just sort of like the chocolate worm cakes have destroyed and a significant part of our, you know, our value today or something, whatever you have to say, then that translation effort makes, you know, the rest go down easier, right? That's what I've learned over years, of especially dealing with like government folks. These are, you know, politically appointed officials who really do not care about a CBE and what it does, right? They're starting to get wise that they should care because it keeps making headlines. But at the same time, they're, just, they're political science majors. I work for a lot of political science graduate students. And they all want to know, are we getting hit by chocolate worm cakes? Yes or no? 
right? So that's, there, there is value in the labels, but yes, I am consistently, as I was comparing them to the Hollywood gossip column, I personally am totally cynical about labels because I know that the devil is in the details. So another thing I've observed that seems in a way cynical, and when I initially thought of this, I was like, wow, you're a horrible person. And then as time has gone on, I realize actually, no, this could be a valuable tool in a sort of intangible way, is um, there's that whole concept of uh, naming something gives you power over it. And in a way, I've seen organizations where I'm like, why are you worrying about attribution? There is nothing you can do about or, so it, it's good to quantify the threat up to a certain point, but the extra work going into attribution is really not going to change how you approach this at all because you're at this level of the maturity model. You only have the resources to do certain things. You're not going to be doing a drone strike on somebody, so why does it matter? And the real answer is, honestly, it builds morale for a lot of people. If you're just going in every day and constantly being slaughtered by machines that are being compromised by you know, just looking at the ridiculous amount of inbound alerts you've got, having your SOC guys go, we need better product stuff because we can't triage the 12,000 alerts every day. Um, it can be pretty depressing. If you can rally around the fact, though, that you can define here are threat actors, and not only those threat actors, but they are these particular entities or causes that are trying to do harm to my brand, my reputation, my intellectual property, my country. Um, to me, Initially, I was like, oh, this is just totally like, who would do that? The more I thought about it, the more I realized that that has an intangible value that probably keeps some shops going. And initially, my thought was like, ha, I, I mock you people for doing this attribution because you're wasting resources. This is one of the few times I think I've convinced myself over time that I'll let you waste that resource because it has an intangible benefit that I didn't even think of in the first place that's probably more valuable than I ever gave it credit for. I don't know if anybody has seen that in their shops or not, but... Um, you know, I mean, I just knew that there was sort of a real sea change once people started talking about threats. And yes, there have been some uh, overemphasis in the marketing arena, to put it nicely, about some of the threat groups. Um, but I think in a way it does make people feel a little bit more in control of the circumstances. Has anyone ever heard the story about the kids with yo-yos? Like there was a study years ago showing that if you have underprivileged kids and you give them a yo-yo and you show them how to use it, like they're arguably their quality of life gets better. And the theory behind this was that if you give someone who doesn't have a lot of control over their environment a system where they can exert control in a small space, they realize it is possible and they start inserting control in larger and larger areas. Because previously they believed it was hopeless. They were just like, oh, I have no control, everything's horrible, bad things are happening to me every day. But by showing them in this limited subset, you now have some control they realize that they can actually control bigger things, and over time they start extrapolating that out. I don't remember the exact paper, but I see this looking at it optimistically as, as sort of a similar model. You have you know, groups that are basically completely overrun with all the stuff they have to do with the security and lack of resources. This is one way it starts a little light at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if that's a false hope, but it's one way I've actually felt a little bit better about this over time is realizing there are a lot of people who get very excited and suddenly feel they're doing something that matters because they know who they're fighting against now as opposed to just, oh my gosh, we're hacked. So, um, so yeah, one of the things we've, we've kind of covered a little bit of this already, um, but there's the fact that basically um, there's a lot of complexity in here. I think Tom jumped ahead with his, uh, I think this was the eighth grade comment. Um, but so I... I still feel, though, and maybe this is a good point for discussion since we, or we could skip over this, that I do feel that, conversely, like the attribution thing, if your org is not mature enough and you start spending a lot of resources on trying to do threat intel, you're doing yourself a disservice. Not because threat intel's not important, not because I don't want you sharing information with me or with Tom or with somebody else where we can make you better, but frankly, you're spending a resource spinning about threat and tell, and if you got that good data, you're going to turn around and go, I'm going to plug it into my, oh, wait, I don't have that system built, or I don't have this system built. And again, so I think that we have an incredibly complex setup right now. I, I think that basically you have like so many levels of maturity that you need to achieve first before you can get anything else done. I think we have rehashed this one, but does anybody else want to comment on that? The fact that like, you know, if you haven't established a monitoring program and a way to implement changes in your environment, being told information you should look for and implement in your environment is not going to help you? Or should we just... We... No, well, because... Right. So at the Research and Education Networking ISAC, 
just lots of moving parts. Um, the Research and Education Networking, ISAC, uh, stood up their collective intelligence framework on their security event system, and this was their, this was their blacklist pool, right? I talked earlier about like one of the two places in the world I'd seen an operational running implementation of the IODEF spec. This was